Well, back then, five years ago, China's trade surpluses was 30 billion a month. Now they're 80 billion a month. And really, China is actually now stealing our jobs. Welcome back to week two of Crash or Boom, where Real Vision investigates what's happening in what may be an inflection point in markets with some of the biggest names in finance. I'm Ash Bennington. Today, I'm joined by Harris Kupperman and Louis Gov. Let me set up the context here for this conversation. Uh, last Friday, we had our CEO and co-founder, Rao Pal, on his show, Rao Pal, The Journeyman, speak with Juliette de Klerk. As many of you know, Juliette de Klerk is ex-hedge fund, ex-investment bank, and now has her own shop, JDI Research. On this episode, Rao and Juliette talked about where we are in the business cycle. The consensus, of course, is for a soft landing. Rao is bullish, as many of you know. Juliet talks about her thesis that the recession or slowdown has already happened and that we may be headed toward an acceleration, that the U.S. may be ahead of the cycle and that the reacceleration may be happening in Europe as well. You're not going to want to miss that if you're interested in the broader macro context. Now, to shift gears here to this show, uh, let me just welcome Harris Kupperman and Louis Gobb to the show. Guys, welcome. Hey, thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Well, it's great to be with you. I've been looking forward to hosting this show. I was going to start out a uh, big picture, but I got to ask, Louis, tell us about the hat. Cuppy gave Le me this hat. He, uh, Lean in Cuppy so we can see it. There you go. <laughs> Cuppy, Cuppy came to visit me in southern France, uh, get a bit of introduction to rugby in the best country, and very kindly offered me this hat. So I'm <laughs> proudly wearing it right now. By the way, it looks good on you. For those Thank of you, you listening on audio, it says make volatility great again. Which I believe is uh, Cuppy's mantra. <laughs> <laughs> volatility is where all the opportunities come from. Well, we'll see if we can uh, make that happen here on the show. Guys, uh, let's talk a little bit about where you see markets. Uh, Louis, you're wearing the hat. Let's start with you. Where do you see this moment right now in macro and in markets? Are we headed toward a cycle of greater volatility? I think so. I think we're heading to a cycle of great volatility. For me, there's three deep structural trends that are sort of interlinking, interlinking with each other. Uh, the first is we have started a structural bull market in emerging markets ex China. Uh, and few people don't realize this yet, but you have emerging market currencies, emerging market bonds, emerging market equity markets, whether you take your Indias, your Indonesias, your Brazils, your Mexicos, your Argentinas. They're all outperforming uh, the U.S. They're all outperforming Western markets on, on all fronts. Um, so that's very exciting. Uh, I think you've got strong fundamentals, st undervaluation, strong momentum, and nobody cares. So for me, it takes all the boxes, and I'm like super, super excited about this. Um, that's your first deep structural trend uh, right now in markets. Your, your second one is that, frankly, Western currencies are being debased. Um, the... The fiscal and monetary path on which we embarked uh, with the COVID crisis is, is simply unsustainable. You know, if you take the U.S. right now, the U.S. is 4% of the global population. It's 40% of global budget deficits. It's 60% of uh, global current account deficits. Uh, these kinds of numbers can't add up. And there is, for now, absolutely no effort to sort of ring that in. Uh, quite the contrary. It seems to be... Uh, uh, like let's keep printing, let's let's keep adding on to this. Um, so that's your second deep structural trend, and and your third is uh, I think we've for the past ten years or so for ESG reasons for lots of different reasons we've massively underinvested in energy and we face a structural energy crisis, and so these three trends sort of are interlinked, feed into each other, uh, and make for I think a, a near term future that promises to be more volatile. Well, Cuppy, uh, that does not sound like a terribly bright assessment of where we are right now. It sounds like volatility is going to be made great again uh, under Louis's model there. Cuppy, where do you think we are? How would you describe this moment? Well, I would agree with Louis. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, the world's going to be a lot more volatile. I, I think I'd stress also you know, the, the fiscal side. I mean, we've lived in a deeply monetary world for 30 years, uh, really, you know, especially since Greenspan and monetary has been driving everything. And when I say monetary, it just means they lower interest rates and assets go up and fiscal's taken over now and the world's not designed for fiscal. It, it's popular fiscal, you know, it's popular with voters, 
but it's, it's not popular with uh, risk assets. And you know, we, we've already seen you know the long part of the bond market fall apart, and I think it's going to get worse. But everything's priced on the ten year, and you know the ten years of that precarious four level, and it keeps fighting and bouncing, and it seems to have broken through. I, I, I don't think the world works at six percent uh, interest rates, which you know is kind of in the middle of the historic range of the last couple of decades. I, I don't see why we can't get back to historical levels, especially given that you know we're running like eight uh, uh, percent fiscal. It, it seems kind of crazy that you know we can't get back to six percent on a on a ten year. And uh, if you get there, I think most risk assets blow up. I think, um, especially you know, PEVC, you know, CRE. I mean, I, which acronym, which, which letters am I missing? Uh, it, it just doesn't look very good. And I, I think it's going to be very volatile. Uh, you know, fortunately, I have a portfolio designed for that. So you know, I'm, I'm just going to sit around and hopefully make some money and then pick up the pieces later on. But no, I think it's going to be a lot of a lot of volatility, and I like volatility. It's really interesting. It's really Both of you guys describe uh, what could reasonably uh, be called reasonably structural call. factors here in terms of uh, what's driving this economic cycle. By the way, we hear some echo there. If you hear that, I apologize for it. Hopefully, we'll really get our producers to pull that out. Uh, so listen, guys, what do you see, uh, Cuppy, first to you as being the key uh, for the next cycle? What's the catalyst and when will we know it's arrived? I think we're in the next cycle. Uh, interest rates are slowly melting. And their response to uh, interest rates is to basically spend more money. Uh, you know, they're trying to, you know, th th these things, you know, nature needs to heal in a way. And, you know, uh, financial nature and capital markets nature, they, they, they heal. And, mar and governments get in the way of that healing. Uh, you know, the, the way that, you know, you heal uh, the, the massive uh, deficits we have and then, you know, debt to GDP is you have uh, sustained periods of high inflation. But uh, you know you have the central bank now raising interest rates, while uh, you know the, the 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 fiscal side is spending at crazier levels. It's like a Red Bull and vodka sort of economy, and you, the the patient's gonna have a heart attack. Uh, I, I think we're in this cycle actually. Uh, the, the, you know we we've been in this cycle. Like there's been guys talking about this for 30 years. It's just that they were early, uh, and uh, the richest nation in the world can push the envelope in ways that. I don't think anyone predicted, but you know what we did during the COVID uh, in terms of fiscal and monetary finally broke the system, and they can't push it back together. Hey, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, it's Raoul here from Real Vision. I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel, get the notifications. We have so many incredible conversations with so many amazing people. It will really help you in your financial journey and your journey to understand just what the hell's going on in this world. Anyway, click subscribe get the notifications and enjoy. So it sounds like, Louis, it sounds like you and uh, Cuppy are on the same page here. You talked about this idea of numbers just don't add up on the fiscal side. Uh, let's unpack that and explain, Louis, where you see this uh, for people who don't follow the macro uh, and fiscal context as closely as you do. Unpack what you see right now. I think I'll add, uh, first, I agree 100% with what Cuppy just said, that we're in the cycle. We're in a very different cycle. Um, Look, for the past 50 years, we've lived in a U.S. Treasury-centric system where, you know, Cuppy said everything's priced up to 10 years. The U.S. Treasury is at the very heart of our financial system. Right. Um, and I think uh, we changed that in two ways. First, by following crazy fiscal and monetary policies on the one hand, but also by changing the very nature of what a U.S. Treasury was for roughly half of the world's population. Uh, you know, when Russia invaded Ukraine, and we confiscated all the Russian assets, uh, not only of the state, but of individuals themselves, of all the Russian oligarchs. Um, we changed the very nature of our financial system because our biggest comparative advantage in the Western world has always been that we have the rule of law and property rights, that you could be black, white, brown, yellow, mu Muslim, Jewish, Christian. You go in front of a court of law in New York, London, or Paris, you have the same rights as the next guy. Then we added a little asterisk to this. We said, except if you're Russian. If you're Russian, we can take all your shit. No questions asked. Uh, we, don't need, we don't need to debate in parliament. We don't need a court order. We can just take it. We get the prime ministers and the presidents together, and we confiscate all your stuff. And so now if you're Chinese, if you're Saudi, if you're Qatari, you think, what do you mean except if you're Russian? Because it could be Russians today. It could be me tomorrow. Especially when you have a foreign policy in the US that actively declares that anybody who's a non-democracy 
is a potential foe to the United States, uh, which has been, you know, the, the sort of the Biden, the Biden uh, doctrine has very been, very much been, you know, dividing the world into democracies and non-democracies. So now the message you're sending out, if you're a non-democracy, the U.S. Treasury for you is not the same as it is for, say, France or Britain, et cetera. Now, the big problem we have in the world is the marginal increase in savings is by and large happening in countries that aren't democracies. It's happening in Saudi Arabia. It's happening in, in, um, in, um, in China, et cetera. Um, so now I mentioned how the U.S. needed to have, you know, 40% of the global budget deficits and that the U.S. needed, therefore, to import between half and two-thirds of the marginal increase of global savings every year to keep the show on the road. Well, if at the same time you stick your finger in the eye of, where the, of the countries where those savings are taking place, the whole system goes out of whack. Uh, so I don't think it's a surprise that U.S. Treasury markets have melted down with the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, it's, uh, so we are shifting towards a different system because if you're a non-democracy, that old system no longer works for you. So that's the first point. The second point, and I'm sorry to be long-winded, is everything's coming to a head now that energy prices are breaking out on the upside. You know, economic activity is energy transformed. Um, whoever has the cheapest cost of energy starts off with a huge comparative advantage. And whenever you have a rising cost of energy, that basically means lower productivity across the economy. Uh, so we're now at a time where we have more and more debt and that needs to be serviced by fewer and fewer people willing to service that debt. And at the same time, the rising cost of energy means that we are going to have weaker productivity going forward. It's a very tough combo. Yeah, and of course, rising rates on the monetary policy side, and in addition, the Fed unwinding some $9 trillion uh, worth of assets on their balance sheet, all creating more supply given fixed demand. Obviously, that has a price impact. Prices down, yields up. Uh, Cuppy, build on what Louis says there. Uh, again, it's not a, an interest. It's not a sort of a, a cyclical view. He's talking about these deep secular factors uh, affecting U.S. Treasury markets and uh, the dynamics of fiscal policy. Well, I mean, I think Lou is really right. I mean, look at our country. We run these massive deficits, trade and also budget. And then it's our current account that kind of plugs it. The current account is guys going in and buying trophy assets at silly cap rates because they're supposed to be safe. Guys don't buy, you know, one cap Manhattan hotels just for giggles. They buy it because they want it to be safe. They don't care about the yield. They don't go out and buy. Copy. Ex explain all that for people who uh, who un who understand macro. It's very clear. But for people who are relatively new to thinking about markets in this way, explain that. Bring it down a little bit so folks can understand. So the U.S. has always uh, been tough on corruption and bribery and all this nonsense. But then we let all the world's dirty officials buy our assets, and we just ignore it. You know, and so you have all these guys that have dirty money in their home country. They need to get the money out of the home country. They probably want to get their families out of the home country because, you know, politics is volatile. And so what do you do if you stole a couple hundred million dollars? You go buy assets in the U.S. because we don't extradite. You know, your family comes here. They buy an HB1 visa. We, we don't ask any questions. Uh, you know, you want to buy some farmland with the HB1 or you want to do like a you know mixed use development with one of these guys. Like they'll lend all the money, bring all the family members here. You know, HP1 never has a, a yield. It's just like zero interest rate loan to some developer. We'll do all the stuff. You can put as much capital as you want here. You know, if, if that country has a revolution or an election and they say your family stole a couple hundred million, well, the U.S. just says, so what? You know, we're not going to send these guys home. You're safe. Your money's safe. That's always been what, you know, plugged the gap. It was dirty money. Uh, a lot of it was recycled IMF money, honestly, uh, you know, come from the U.S. coming back home. Uh, and, and so this sort of thing plugged it. And you know, I'm not saying you know, there's varying degrees of dirty, but um, guys just wanted safe capital here. And when you look at the U.S. 10 year, like the fact that people were buying these things at sub two for years and years makes no sense. I mean, you buy it at a sub two, not because you want the yield or even the appreciation. It's just because it, it's a safe asset and suddenly it's no longer a safe asset. Why own this when you could own gold? And you can own gold in a country that's considered safe. You know, you custody it somewhere on the way up that seems to really care about rule of law and that needs a rule of law. You know, like look at a place like Dubai. It only works because it's the, you know, it's the, it's the transaction point for a lot of countries that hate each other. 
I have friends living in Dubai. They say, you know, Russians and Ukrainians all get along. You know, Israelis, Palestinians, they all get along. Like the the, the country, the only way that the system they built works and that little, you know, plot of dirt, sand really, is to, you know, not take sides in anything and make sure that people can do business with, with a functioning legal system. It's like what the U.S. used to be. So I, I'd much rather have my gold custody in, in Dubai right now. And, you know, then it, you stop the recycling of all this capital, which is why, you know, U.S. Uh, markets are starting to, you know, get, get a little rough on the edges. It's why the 10-year, you know, has no bid to it anymore, even though and it, it doesn't help that the U.S., you know, beyond, you know, sticking a finger in their eye, like uh, Louis said, it, it is also running insane deficits during the boom phase. I mean, if we're running eight, almost nine during the good part, like, what do you think happens when we have a recession? It's going to be 17. Like, what's going to happen? I mean, what, what's going to happen when, uh, the, the, you know, when, when, when all the uh, paper we have right now, all Cuppy, the treasuries Cuppy, can you all reset? Can you unpack that for people who are relatively new to this? You talk about the, the dual deficit that we have, uh, current accounts deficit, fiscal deficit. Explain that position for people who don't follow this story as closely as you do. Well, we have a fiscal deficit because our government spends more than it takes in. And I don't think they have any desire. I mean, there's no Tea Party left. I mean, the Republicans just want to spend money on different things. Uh, we have a trade deficit because we don't really produce anything here anymore. We, we produce some technological products and then everything's assembled and produced overseas and then shipped back here. You know, all we produce is some IP. Um, and then we don't really, I mean, the, the way this, this system balances over time is you know, the current account. And, you know, the capital gets recycled back in. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm explaining this quite well, but you know, this is three legs of stool. I think I think you are explaining it well, but I think the old rule of thumb was that when you have twin deficits, so budget deficits and trade deficits that are over five percent of your GDP, in the old days, the IMF would start booking its plane tickets. Um, you know, if you were <laughs> if you were Argentina or you were Greece or you were anybody, you're you know, if you had rent twin deficits over 5% of GDP, it's basically you're leaning a little too far above your skis. Now, today the U.S., you know, is basically past 10%. Now, you could say the U.S. is more equal than others. It's more equal than others because it has the U.S. dollar uh, is the world's reserve currency. It's the world's main trading currency. So the U.S., unlike anybody else, can always settle its deficits in its own currency. It can print more dollars, say, look, you know, Toyota... You take dollars. Um, Venezuela, the oil you buy, you take dollars. You don't have a choice. Um, and so for the US, the rules were always a little bit different. Now, the challenge is A, the deficits are, are getting bigger and bigger, but the deep down, the reality of running massive twin deficits for too long is that either your cost of funding goes up, which historically is what happens to other countries, not the US, or your currency goes down. Uh, which is, you know, historically what would happen to the U.S. The dollar would go up and it would go down and it would go up and it would go down. Um, so today, logically, and, and to Cuppy's point, you know, right now the U.S. is running budget deficits of roughly seven and a half, eight percent of GDP with full employment. And that's nuts. The U.S. has never done that before. So you know that in a recession it's going to be 15 plus. And so you know that in the next recession, when it is 15 plus and when the, the Fed has no choice but to cut, the U.S. dollar is going to get smoked. Um, and that's what I think is different in this cycle in that usually if you're an asset allocator, you would look at the U.S. dollar as being an anti-fragile currency, that if things go badly in the global system, the dollar typically goes up. And so you want to be long dollars to hedge against potential hits. Today, you know that if and when a hit comes, the Fed is going to cut, the U.S. dollar is going to get smoked. So the dollar is no longer an anti-fragile asset. It's now a very fragile asset. And that's a big shift, I think, for most people's portfolio constructions. And most, most people haven't reflected that in their, in their portfolios. I mean, Kami, do you agree? Yeah, look, if you were an EM manager or just a wealthy guy living in a EM country, you wanted to own dollars because you know, it, it protected you. You wanted to own dollar assets because when your country had a problem, your dollar assets would appreciate. I think we're going to trade like an EM. And, you know, if we trade as an EM instead of a, a DM, uh, I think the dollar can go down and it, it will. And, you know, we've had this unique privilege in the United States that when we have a recession, 
interest rates decline and it, it kind of soothes the recession. Whereas, you know, if you look at Brazil, when they have a recession, interest rates explode. The currency, you know, is, is the release valve versus, you know, interest rates in, in our country. And, uh, you know, what if we have a recession here and fiscal goes to 15 or some higher crazy number and uh, interest rates uh, blow out and, you know, it, it gets fixed through the currency? I don't think anyone's ready for that. Every single portfolio is uh, positioned exactly against that, that, that trade working out. But I don't see why we should uh, act like America if, if our politicians are acting like Brazil. And Brazil is actually being the same ones here. And actually, the and place this, that you can obviously see that is when you look at the uh, total public debt to GDP ratio. I'm looking at a 60-year chart right now. Uh, starts at about 40% and now moves to about 120%, meaning uh, for every $1 uh, in GDP, we have 120 in aggregate debt. Uh, this is a, a substantial percentage. Is that the place where this is building up? Oh, you can see it in lots of places. Sorry to butt in. You, the, I think Please. where you see it the most is in the interest expense of the U.S. government debt, which is not going parabolic, which is something new that's never really happened before. As the U.S. is now rolling over debt that used to cost one or one and a half or maybe two percent into debt that now costs five, the interest expense is you know going parabolic. It's now over. It's now more. The interest expense of the U.S. government is now bigger than the 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 spending on the military. Um, and I think, to be honest, if you've, if you've ever done emerging markets, um, what you're now seeing in, in the U.S. feels pretty familiar. Um, what you're now seeing, and it's not just the U.S., by the way, you know, it's the same in Europe. What I found fascinating this summer is the data coming out of Germany could not be worse. You know, it's like you've got weakest ISM surveys uh, since reunification, plummeting industrial production. I mean, you, you, you name it, the data out of Germany looks horrible, horrible. And everyday boon yields go up. Um, and, you know, this summer in the U.S., for me, the big story of the summer is how a lot of the growth data in the U.S. has started to roll over. A lot of the inflation data in the U.S. has started to roll over. And bond yields continue to inch higher. Um, right. if, you're, if, you, if you know emerging markets, if you've traded emerging markets, this is a pattern that you're very familiar with. But in developed markets, like somehow nobody's talking about this. You know, everybody's talking all day about how China is going to implode when U.S. Treasury yields are going up every single day. That should be the big story, um, I, in my mind, especially since we live in a world where, again, to Cuppy's point, everything is priced off the 10 years. The fact that the 10 year sells off every day sh should be front and center of the Wall Street Journal, of Business Week, of The Economist. Instead, we get covers on China day in, day out. Yeah, I mean, everyone I know keeps saying buy the 10 year because when the market crashes with the recession that's coming, uh, the 10 year is going to rally. And I keep saying, what if uh, the market crashes because the 10 year goes to six? <laughs> you know, like that, that seems like the more likely outcome. Well, especially given that short rates are where they are, right? Long rates should be at least where short rates are. Yeah, Talk it's all a mess. So, so, so talking of which, I think you guys have done an excellent job uh, in framing out the broader macro picture as you see it. Let's talk a little bit about market impact. Uh, what do you guys see happening next? Based on this thesis, how are you positioning yourselves? Copy, start with you. I'm just long hard assets. I mean, I'm along all sorts of things that are below the cost of producing them that are, you know, producing a lot of cash flow, or I think they're going to produce a lot of cash flow in the next year or two. But we're just long hard assets, preferably ones that don't have a massive GDP component to them. Um, you know, we, we own a lot of uranium, we own a lot of offshore energy, we own a bunch of land. None of this stuff particularly needs the economy, you know, to function. Like I don't really have a strong view on what happens with GDP. I, I just think fiscal stays stimulative, but I can see a world where the the ten year blows up and uh, fiscal, you know, isn't enough. You know, in, in 08, a bunch of subprime things blow up, blew up. The whole financial system froze, and it didn't really matter that you know oil was 140 because it all fell apart. And um, you know, I could see a world where the 10 year goes to six percent and everything blows up and freezes. And you know, I want to you know be, be kind of immune to that world. Louis Cuppy is uh, long uh, hard assets. Where are you? How are you positioned? I'm not positioned that differently. I'm I'm long a lot of energy. Uh, I'm very very long various parts of the energy complex. My take is is pretty simple. Um, you've had everything for energy to go down in the past really six months. First, you had the Iran-Saudi deal, peace breaking out in the Middle East. That should have been energy bearish, uh, and it wasn't. Um, you've had a whole lot of bad news on China that should have been energy bearish. 
uh, and and energy continues to grind higher. Um, you've had Europe heading straight into a recession. You've had growth rolling over in the U.S. Uh, you know, everything should have pointed towards energy taking a breather. Instead, it continues to to grind higher. So, I love I love something that basically contradicts uh, you know common common belief. Um, and I particularly like energy for another reason, is that I tend to believe that energy today is the ultimate anti-fragile asset. Um, you know, for the past 35 years, you know, maybe you liked Microsoft or Alibaba or LVMH. You, you bought the stocks you wanted that you liked. And to reduce the volatility of your portfolio, you bought U.S. treasuries. And you knew that if there was an exogenous shock, if some planes flew in, into the World Trade Center or if... A, you know, a virus broke out, something that you just couldn't foresee, um, that maybe your stocks would get hit, but your bonds would save the day. And that worked great for 35 years. And the reality is it stopped working with COVID. It hasn't now worked for, for two and a half years. OECD government bonds have been dogs with fleas. Uh, when equity prices go down, actually bonds go down more. Uh, you saw this again in August. In August, yeah. S&P was down, bonds were down more. What was up? Again, energy, just like most of 2022, where bonds were down, equities were down, energy was up. So I think we're moving into a world where energy is the new anti-fragile asset class. It's the new thing that actually diversifies your portfolio. Meanwhile, nobody owns it. Nobody owns it because it's a very small part of benchmarks, because of ESG constraints, because of you know a terrible decade, basically between 2013 and 2021, or eight years. Lots of reasons to not own it. Um, and, but what's going to happen, I think is the more energy remains an anti-fragile asset class. And again, it was again in August, the more, you know, so much of the world's money now is managed by computers that it's going to start popping up in all sorts of quant models where it's like, oh, energy actually is a good diversifier and you're going to start seeing the flows. And right now, all the guys that are long energy are guys like Cuppy, myself, uh, guys who are almost religious about it. Uh, who, you know, we're not in there for the next 20%. We're in there for the next 300%. Um, we're not selling because it's up like, you know, it's going to be up 10 or 20. So I could see a lot of marginal buyers coming in. And I, you know, meanwhile, the companies, it's not like the companies themselves are going to issue paper because they're not doing any capital spending. If anything, they're buying back their own shares. So yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of energy for the foreseeable future. Cubby, over to you. Uh, what's your thesis on energy? More broadly, and then we'll talk a little bit about the case for uranium. Well, I mean, in terms of energy, like the, the thing we do, at my the thing I do is I invest in sectors that have been starved of capital for long periods of time that have, you know, destroyed uh, careers that people don't want to talk about anymore because they've just gone straight down for a decade. You know, I, I don't buy it when it's down 30%. Uh, you know, I, I want something that's been down 30% every year for like 10 years. And then it just kind of makes this bottom, you know, it makes this saucer looking thing. And, you know, it just starts going up again. And I've been doing the same thing for 25 years and it mostly works. And energy has just been starved of capital. I mean, look how much capital was spent, uh, you know, going into 2014. And then it just falls off a cliff. And like, think of the inflation, you know, we're not back anywhere near where we were the first half of last decade in terms of spending. But oil for services, everything costs twice as much. So in terms of, you know, actual barrels that's going to produce the amount of spending we're doing, it's not even enough to run in place, really. I mean, production isn't really growing. And, you know, they're spending the money on much harder assets while, you know, the low cost, easy stuff is, is slowly dying out. And so, no, I think the price of energy is going to go up. Uh, you know, I think uh, demand is going to keep growing. You have six billion people that want the same standard of living that I have. Right. Um, and I mean, a lot of these people that don't have refrigerators and microwaves and, you know, cars and, you know, air conditioning, like they're going to get all this stuff. I believe in human progress. And, you know, I think energy consumption is going to keep going up. And I don't know where it all comes from because there's no spending on it, like none. I mean, they, they're building some windmills offshore and some solar plants, but that doesn't do anything. It's a rounding error. That stuff all consumes energy up front anyway. It's just going to make the problem worse. Um, and there's no EROI to it anyway. No, I, I just think energy is going to go up. I mean, my, my, my view of how to play it is owning the, the energy services companies. You know, I own uh, offshore energy. Uh, I'm in Oslo right now to go meet with some uh, energy companies. There's an energy conference this week. 
Uh, but but I'm there. I mean, I, I think these energy services companies, a lot of this equipment in offshore energy, it trades at 10 cents on the dollar of replacement cost. I mean, historically, this stuff trades to 1.5 to two times uh, replacement cost. Uh, we, we have a long way to go. And these things are already up many times. And, you know, I think they trade at low single digit cash flow multiples. And, you know, in, in a world uh, starved of, you know, Cash, like I, th- I think that's going to be a great place to be. And they don't have, you know, net debt. They have net cash balance sheets. Most of these things, they're anti-fragile in that, in the same way Louis talks about. And you know, it's it, it's going to be volatile. Uh, but you know, Louis's right. I'm not playing for the next twenty percent. And if the next twenty percent is up or down, I don't really care. You know, and these things get overbought and oversold, and everyone gets tossed off the descent. You'd be amazed at how many people have bought these things and sold and bought them and sold and made no money while they keep going up. <laughs> you have to just have a view and ride. And, and, and you know, the price of oil, you know, it, it, it's, it's a crazy thing because it's so political and it's meant to destroy traders. You know, every time oil goes up, we do the Iran sanctions rumor again and oil drops three dollars. <laughs> like, how do you trade that? It just it little just gaps down three dollars. They, they get some third tier newspaper to say we're doing Iran sanction release, you know, or we make friends with Venezuela. Like, how do you trade this product? You can't trade this product. You need to just buy it and, and stay with it. I mean, look, you, you get this roll yield now. If you own Brent oil, it pays you one and a half percent a month to own it. Why wouldn't you own it? Why would you own uh, T-bills at four and change when you can own Brent oil and in three months you're ahead? You know, like there's this things you could do, which is why I think oil keeps going up and capital keeps getting allocated and reallocated. Copy that was a brilliant 50,000 foot description of this market. I mean, is there anything <laughs> on earth right now as a sector where the underlying supply and demand seem more detached from reality uh, and the unusual, almost quasi religious sermons we get about this space? I mean, it just seems like it's just totally out of whack. It, it, it's totally out of whack. I mean, look, day rates on an offshore drill rig, uh, you know, a Gen 7 offshore drill rig. Uh, it's 500,000 a day. Last cycle, it peaked at 700 and it bottomed at 100,000. And uh, everyone went bankrupt. Every single company went bankrupt, except uh, Transocean, which probably wish they did. Um, and, you know, we're back at 500,000. These guys are finally making money for the first time in a decade. But what are they doing with the money? They're all doing buybacks and dividends. They're not building any more equipment. I don't think they ever build more equipment in their lifetime. Uh, these things last go around where 700 million, 800 million each. I think it's a billion and a quarter if you wanted to build one of these. If you call a Korean shipyard, they're going to laugh at you because they all lost so much money last time. They're going to want 75% down. And then it's four years to build it, but no one in Korea has built one of these things in a decade. They don't even know how. And even if they wanted to, all their berths are full of LNG. You know, This is one of those things where you could look at it. There's no free vessels. It, it's, it's pretty obvious unless you think the price of oil goes back into the 50s. And no one can produce oil in the 50s. That's what we already learned. The shale guys can't. I mean, the Saudis barely can. Like, so it, it just, I don't think it's going to go that other direction. And I think the sector is just totally out of whack. Meanwhile, look at uh, imports from India. I mean, look, China's supposed to be blowing up and I'd love to you know, talk about that next, but you know, look at the import numbers in, in, in China uh, d- during a blow up. Um, all time highs. You know, huh? Let me jump. All time highs. China's oil imports are at all time highs. They're, they're- right, right. So, I mean, Everyone's growing. Uh, look, uh, Europe oil numbers are flat-ish, and they're having a depression. Uh, the U.S. is up year over year, and we're supposed to be having a recession right now, or you know, they're promising us a recession. Like, like, where's the demand destruction going to be? And like, where does the supply come from? Yeah, I was just going to ask that as well. Louis, where, no, where do you see this uh, in terms well, of the supply, supply demand? Mismatch? No, the, for all the reasons Cuppy highlighted, the supply isn't coming on. Um, and so prices, in spite of all the bad news that's out there, prices keep on grinding higher. Um, and, you know, that's why I'm extremely, I remain extremely bullish uh, energy. I remain extremely bullish emerging markets. Um, you know, places like Latin America that have started a, a genuine boom. You know, this is this is the first cycle in my career where, you know, places like Uruguay, Brazil, Chile, all get to cut interest rates while the Fed is still tightening. Um, it's uh, because you know they're they're getting rewarded for their non-crazy COVID policies. Uh, they didn't go down the well of MMT. They didn't go down the well of you know sending free money to people, um, and they're getting rewarded for it now. Um, 
we're, we have a bull market in Latin America. We have a bull market in the Middle East. We have a bull market in Southeast Asia. We have a bull market in India. And, and to Cuppy's point, as all these people get richer in, in these environments, they buy motorcycles, they buy cars. You know, one of the, the biggest development nobody talks about, you know, everybody talks about how China's imploding. Um, nobody talks about how from nowhere five years ago, China's now the biggest car exporter in the world. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it overtook Germany last year. It's overtaken Japan and Korea this year. And how's it done that? It's done that by selling cars that are less than 10,000 US dollars. Um, some of them are electric, you know, you can buy the, the BYD Seagull is 11,000 US dollars, but most of the cars China sells abroad, it sells to emerging markets. It sells to Indonesia, to India, to, to Chile, to Mexico, to wherever else. And these cars are not electric cars. They're just gasoline cars. And, and so now what's happening is people in India and in Indonesia all of a sudden can afford cars because they're much cheaper than they used to be. But the, you know that makes extra fuel demand. Um, and it's not like you know we've spent a ton of money in the past 10 years building the refineries we need, building new oil wells, building the pipelines. Now, all that is coming. Um, and you're going to see an infrastructure spending boom across emerging market of epic proportions. Um, you know, most people always tell me nobody can replicate what China did. And it's true. You know, between 2003 and 2013, China poured more concrete than the U.S. did in the 20th century. And, you know, that's when the U.S. was building the interstate highway system and New York and Chicago and all sorts of things. China did more than that in 10 years. It was nuts. Um, but if you take, if you draw an axis that goes from Istanbul to Jakarta, that's 3.6 billion people. So three times the Chinese population. If that axis does a third of the Chinese capital spending, then we have a, a commodity spending boom of epic proportions again. And right now, India alone is doing roughly the same amount that China did from 2003 to 2007. Over the next five years, India will do about that much. And that's just India. You can add all these other countries. So we're looking at an infrastructure spending boom of epic proportions across many emerging markets. And the reason this emerging market spending boom is starting is that all these countries now have access to commodities in their own currency. And it's a game changer. You know, if you're India, you always had big current account deficits, big uh, uh, budget deficits. So you were always constrained in your ability to project yourself. And then here comes Russia and says, hey, I'll sell you coal. I'll sell you copper. I'll sell you oil. I'll do a five-year contract in rupees. Um, now, all of a sudden, you have no constraint on building roads, building airports, building power plants. So you let rip. And that's what you're seeing in Indonesia. That's what you're seeing in Thailand. That's what you're seeing everywhere. It's the fact that you can now get commodities in your own currency is a game changer for any emerging market. It removes all constraints to growth. Guys, we've got so many questions and I want to get to them in just a second. Uh, but you guys have laid out this thesis, supply demand mismatch in uh, energy sector, growth in emerging markets. How are you guys positioned? How are you playing it? What's the thesis? What are the instruments you're using and what's the time horizon? I'll let Louis hit this one first. I mean, he's the emerging markets guy. I think he's right. I'll just say one last thing on emerging markets. Uh, you know, if you were a Brazilian guy, a wealthy Brazilian guy, you always paid your money in Miami real estate. And suddenly you kind of look around, and you say, why don't we buy some uh, property in Rio? Or maybe if I want the money out of my own country, why, why don't I go, you know, to Uruguay or Paraguay? Well, why don't I go, you know, somewhere close to home and put the money? Because it looks a little safer now than uh, just buying USA. I, I, it, it's leaving the money at home. And I think that's that recycling thing is all directly related to what we did to the Russians. So I, I agree 100% with what Cuppy said. So the first thing you can play is basically the, the financial centers in emerging markets that are going to be booming because they're going to be doing a lot of the recycling of that, those savings. So it might be Dubai, it might be Singapore, it might be Hong Kong, it might be uh, Uruguay. Uh, all these places have you know, financial centers, growing financial centers, all the money that used to go, whether to Miami, whether to Switzerland, whether to London, is not going to stay in emerging markets. So these places are going to know an epic boom, a boom of epic proportions. Um, and you're seeing real estate in Dubai go through the roof. You're seeing real estate in, in uh, Singapore go through the roof. Uh, and I think others, others will follow. So that, you know, that's one way you can play it. Um, 
Look, it, it, it all depends where you want to be on the risk, spe- risk spectrum. Um, I think one of the best trades out there is on the lower end of the risk spectrum is Latin American, uh, both government debt and corporate debt. Um, you know, I was just in Chile and they've, they now refer to the Central Bank of Mexico as the Bundesito for the Bundesbank. Uh, and, you know, you look at how Mexico's handled its, uh, its affairs through COVID. Uh, and they were, um, you know, it was them in Sweden that didn't basically lose the plot. And they now get, they now get the rewards. You get a strong currency, lower bond yields, et cetera. Now, you know, you look at things like, you know, Pemex bonds. You can buy Euro Pemex bonds, swap them back into, uh, into Mexican peso and make 16, 17% a year. Um, and I would say that, you know, with it, given my view on oil prices, that seems to me like a, a fairly attractive proposition. Um, you know, two year, two year paper, or you can buy Colombian um, bank paper, you know, yielding for one year, 15, 16% in a currency that's one of the most undervalued currencies out there. And that always tends to rise when oil prices go up. Um, so there's, there's, there's lots of, of different possibilities out there. I think if you're non-American, one of the best trades on the Fink's income world, it only works if you're non-American, but just to buy Venezuelan um, government debt or, or PDV, uh, PDVA bonds, because, you know, these things are trading at 10 cents on the dollar. At some point, the Americans will have to lift the sanctions on Venezuela because the Americans can't be pissed off at Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Venezuela all at the same time. You got to sort of pick your fights. Um, and Venezuela isn't an existent, existential fight for the U.S. So that's an, an easy one to, to bury, especially as oil prices rise. So, you know, I think that the Latin American debt space is, is fascinating. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's not the highest uh, returns, but it's very low risk. So the, 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 I think the risk profile is, is, is a very attractive one. And then beyond that, Look, I think equities in Southeast Asia, equities in India. Um, but you also have a number of, I think, very interesting companies in China that are not trading at single-digit P, single-digit cash flows, that are actually growing very, very fast in emerging markets. Whether you look at your BYDs, whether you look at your Alibabas, they're increasingly plays on the broader emerging markets more than um, more than develop uh, more than just China. Yeah, very well detailed there, Louis. Uh, Kepi, what's your play? How are you thinking about it? What's your time horizon? What's the thesis? Well, so Louis will give you the no risk ones. I, I'm Mr. Torque. Uh, let's talk <laughs> about the Torquey ones. <laughs> I, I own some it. Argentina. I, I, I own a basket of it. There's this guy. Uh, well, look, Argentina's hit rock bottom, like complete rock bottom. Uh, they don't have a currency anymore. They effectively don't have a functioning banking system. Like nothing works. Um, and, uh, the Argentines have finally given up on it. You know, they, they used to do, the elections used to be Peronism and then Peronism light. And now this guy, Malay, who's, uh, a macro libertarian is, uh, in the lead by a lot. Uh, it's likely he's going to win. Uh, he's one of the first politicians ever that seems to actually understand what the problem is and how you fix an economy. Uh, if he doesn't win, uh, this lady named Bullrich is going to win. And, uh, she's very much like him. Whereas he just wants to take a chainsaw and basically fire every government worker, get rid of, he blow up the central bank, uh, you know, basically just do a whole reboot. She kind of wants to do it over like three months so that, you know, you don't have people <laughs> out on the streets rioting. Um, I, I don't know which one's going to win, but I think Argentina assets will do well. I mean, it's a, actually a well-educated country. The infrastructure is surprisingly good for a place that doesn't have like a functioning currency. Um, there's a lot of natural resources. All they need to do is fix the mess they have for themselves, where they have two different exchange rates. They have, you know, uh, all sorts of import-export controls. You can't run a business. And, you know, with all, once they get rid of all this nonsense, I think the ag sector is going to boom. I think mining is going to do amazingly well. Uh, Vaca Muerta is probably, you know, the, the number two shale asset in the world. But no one really knows because they're not using modern technology to produce it. And they can't export it anyway. They haven't built a pipeline. No one wants to put money in the country. I think a lot of things can go right in a hurry there once uh, the mm-hmm. sane people in charge and the assets are obscenely cheap. USD ARS just, uh, basically looks like uh, Y equals X squared, right? I mean, it just goes like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but, but, to, but to to go to, so how do you play to, to add up on this? Well, to up on, add up on Argentina because I think it's very important actually. Is if you think of the next, I don't know, twelve months, you could have great news on Argentina. 
you could have good news on Venezuela if the U.S. moves moves away from its sanctions, which I think is likely. Um, and then the rest of Latin America is booming. All of a sudden, you get a narrative where the whole of Latin America looks pretty good, and you get a lot of flows coming into Latin America, and it's not obvious who the marginal seller is going to be at that time. Um, so the when you look at the you know the the news flow over the next six to nine months, you have to be overweight Latin America in general. Cubby, what's the play? How do you get exposure to Argentina? Is it the sovereigns? Is it elsewhere? I don't know about the sovereigns. They, 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 Argentina has a long history of screwing uh, foreign bondholders. <laughs> I think it's just in their blood. Um, but no, I think you, you look, there's a bunch of these GDRs. I mean, Argentina was a very rich country and they got themselves a bunch of US listed GDRs uh, over time. And if you looked at these things, they're incredibly volatile. Uh, you know, when Macri won, they were all five baggers, and then they all, you know, collapsed seventy uh, percent when he lost. I, I think uh, they, they could all go up again, and they're obscenely cheap. But don't look at the financials; they make no sense. They use inflationary accounting. I mean, there's no currency right now. Uh, you, you look at it and you say, you know, you buy this company; it has this many megawatts of power uh, plant. Well, what, what's the U.S. market cap? That seems cheap for megawatts. Compare that to Colombia. Okay, it seems even cheap for Colombia standards. You know, you know, you look at a company; this is how much cement they produce. Well, they're not producing any cement right now, but the plant is there. You know, this is cheap. You look at a company with uh, farmland. This is cheap compared to this. Uh, you know, I, it, it's not rocket science. You buy things at 10% of replacement cost when they have tailwinds and things even get better. And by the time you can build a spreadsheet model and it all makes sense, that's when Citibank's having the Argentina recovery uh, roadshow conference. And that's when you sell. <laughs> you know, it's it just do this thing I've been doing for a long time. It, it sort of works. You know, when Argentina, when, when Citibank calls me up, they say we rented a private jet and we're all going to Argentina because <laughs> these companies all need to raise capital. Well, that's probably when I hit the sell button. Gabby, <laughs> it's delightfully fundamental and cynical. I love it. <laughs> History has a way of repeating. <laughs> All right, guys, I wanted to jump in uh, and ask some of these questions here because we've got some great ones coming in. Uh, the first one is uh, from Valtteri. Uh, actually, this is a topic we touched on a little bit earlier. Uh, Valtteri says, great to have these two on. Please ask the gentleman about Florida real estate. We touched on this a little bit earlier in, on a uh, relative basis, uh, but what do you think about it in an absolute basis, Florida? That's for Cuppy. Oh. I mean, Florida has the most net migration of any state. Uh, that's usually good for real estate. I mean, Florida, has, people are fleeing all these other states because they're horribly mismanaged with high taxes and a lot of crime. I mean, it's still incredible to me that you can walk into any store you want and steal anything you want and everyone's just kind of okay with it these days. I mean, Florida, they'll shoot you. Um, and uh, that, that's why people want to go to Florida. Um, and I think you're going to see the population keep growing because Florida mostly functions and you know, uh, I'm very bullish Florida land because uh, it's uh, there's a shortage, and land is the most torqued thing to what happens to population. Uh, I own a company called uh, Saint Joe, the, the one of the largest owners of land. It's in the Florida Panhandle, which means you know it's the, the starting point for valuation is very low. But uh, you know, there's a lot of people moving there. It's very very pretty, and uh, it doesn't have a lot of the same problems with. You know, hundred-year-old infrastructure, logistics, everything else that uh, South Florida has. Where, you know, in South Florida, they're thinking in little, tiny, you know, half-acre segments. And St. Joe, they they just own a couple of different counties. They can make big, long-range plans and decide, you know, where all the infrastructure goes. And I think it's going to end up being a better place to live. You know, talking uh, about durable trends, Cuppy, and this is an important one, you, you sort of do wonder the forces of virtualization that have been unleashed uh, by the COVID pandemic and the reopening. Uh, folks just do not want to spend nine to five in an office the way they did in the Mad Men era. Uh, it just seems sort of vestigial at this point. You, so you see people fleeing New York City, uh, whether they're going to New Jersey and Connecticut uh, for a uh, you know, the short hop if they have to come in, say, two or three days a week, or if they're totally virtualized, if they're going to Florida. Uh, you see the same thing on the West Coast with uh, Californians moving to Texas. What does this look like from a long-term perspective? How is it sustainable uh, for these states, uh, blue states in the Northeast uh, and in the West, uh, California, New York, and uh, New Jersey and others, uh, to maintain uh, these huge differentials in terms of state and local income tax when essentially uh, you can move someplace else and not pay it? I mean, is is this something that folks are thinking about uh, and what do you see the risks there as? Well, I don't think the, the folks running these states think about it or particularly care. 
Uh, you know, they, they have four year cycles and these are generational problems. Uh, I think the ultimate solution is an exit tax. So you, you ought to leave California and New York while you still can. Um, no, I, I think they're going to keep bleeding people and be Detroit. Uh, New York, you know, you used to have a reason you had to be there. You had to be there if you want to do finance because every roadshow went through New York. All the clients were in New York. I mean, settlement clearing was in New York. Uh, you don't have to do any of that. You, you don't even have to be in the United States anymore to do this. And, you know, the, the assets, I mean, if you look at these statists, they had this, uh, you know, it goes back to feudalism that you have a hard asset, which is uh, land and the serfs on your land. And then, you know, it became a factory and then it became a, you know, something else. And it, it, now, you know, the, the assets up here, it's, it's uh, you know, the ability to do work and to think and, you know, to have intellectual capital. That's very mobile. I mean, I get on a jet and go to the next place uh, in a second if I get a better deal. And better deal isn't just lowest tax rate because a ton of places now with the tax rate zero. Better deal is also quality of life and, you know, all sorts of uh, other things that governments offer in terms of getting rid of bureaucracy and stupidity in your life. And so I think countries and states are going to have to, you know, actually go attract the best and brightest again. And, you know, the U.S. always had an edge in that, that people wanted to go to the U.S. There's a lot of countries fighting for people like us now. And, uh, you know, exit tax is what keeps the people in. It's, it's, uh, it's the iron curtain in a way. Uh, Louis, maybe you're not as cynical as I am. No, no, I am. And I, I would add that I, I grew up in France. And you can take the boy out of France, but you can't take the marks out of the boy. Um, it's, you know, if, if you think of it in Marxist terms, the, you know, Marx explained that your political superstructure was reflected of your economic infrastructure below. That basically, you know, the economic, the, whoever dominated your economic class chose the political structure above. Now, and Marx's point was that you had, you, you know, an agrarian society that had moved to an industrial society, but the political structure hadn't changed. Therefore, you needed revolutions to, 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 to change all this. Um, to Cuppy's point, we've gone through another change. We've moved from industrial economies where you have, I don't know, IBM that hires 100,000 people and Citibank that hires 100,000 people and Procter & Gamble that hires 100,000 people and where most of the value added was created by these massive groups to an economy that's now far more fragmented and where the value add is is spread all over the place in an economy of knowledge and that is no longer an industrial economy and yes in such an economy the guy who actually controls his own value added can decide where he wants to be taxed at what for at what rate and what makes sense for him and you know what makes sense for cuppy may be different than what makes sense for me and different for for you um but uh but for states it does require a complete rethink of how they they run now so far there's right. been none of that rethink instead what we've done is just pile on the debt it's like we're going to keep pretending that we're in the same system and that everything will work out in the end by piling on debt and kicking the can down the road kicking the can down the road but then you move to the to the time where all of a sudden that servicing of the debt goes from Five percent of your tax receipts to ten percent of your tax receipts to twenty-five percent of your tax receipts to thirty-five percent of your tax receipts, and before you know it, you choke on your debt. Uh, and I fear that's where we're heading into a number of Western countries. Copy. Would you like to pick up on that? Thirty minutes ago, uh, you know, nature heals, and if if you. you uh, the, the governments can't adjust to the way the world has changed. You know, it's not like you have a factory there and they just keep taxing the factory more and more. Uh, and, and yeah, they're going to have to adjust. And the, the adjustment is going to have to come somewhere else. And it's uh, going to come through a lot of inflation if they just keep papering it over. So if Come, you look here's at a question. Go ahead, Sorry. Louis, please. Well, please. one of the best history books was a, a guy called Toynbee who wrote a book called History, and it's like, you know, this phone book of a book, um, where he studies the rise and fall of every civilization. And his point is that, you know, civilizations get a challenge, and either the elites rise to the challenge, and you move on, and you progress, and you move on to the next challenge, or you don't, or they don't. And if they don't, you need the elites to be replaced and changed. Uh, and usually this happens through revolutions. Um, you get revolutions, change of the elites, 
new elite and hopefully they address the challenge. And if they don't, then in time, your civilization collapses. Um, now, the beauty of the democratic system is you can change the elites without bloodshed, without destruction of properties, without all the things that entailed in the revolution. Uh, that was always the comparative advantage of democracies. It's not that democracies, we pick the best guys, it's that we can get rid of guys. That, that's, that's what democracies are good for. Um, it's you can throw the bums out. Um, increasingly though, across the Western world, you're seeing this in Europe, but I would agree, I, I would argue you're seeing this in the US, you vote, you vote for guys, but you still get the same policies regardless. Um, take the U.S. and I'm not American, so I don't want to look like I'm throwing the stone. But you know, President Trump gets elected on the promise to bring all the troops back home. He says we're going to pull out of Syria, and the general staff says no, we're not. And in the end, they don't pull out of Syria, which I found mind mind boggling. Um, as a former military officer myself, that the army could say, yeah, we're not, gonna, we're just going to disregard that order. Uh, to me, is mind blowing. Um, but there you go. Um, that's the world that we live in. And the same is true in Europe where you vote guys in, but the real decisions are made in Brussels anyway. So it's like politics just become entertainment. So we've uh, got a politicians and totally, uh, in Europe and also North America, they seem totally divorced from what the average guy on the street wants or needs. I mean, the politicians work for the big corporations and that's fine. You can have your, you know, elite that runs things. It's, you know, how it's been going for a couple thousand years. I'm, I'm kind of okay with it, but it's not democracy anymore. I mean, and um, I think you just need a, a bigger crisis. We haven't had the big crisis yet. You don't have a Maybe. really, you don't have a proper crisis. Remember, nature always heals and it's gonna heal through the 10 year collapsing and an inflationary crisis. And then, you know, I think you're gonna get new guys. Uh, or, or I don't know, maybe, maybe these guys just, uh, they're all in their 80s. They can't make it another decade. Like it, it'll heal that way. <laughs> maybe maybe rising energy prices will be the catalyst for, for the big change. Um, because let's face it, we've had a malinvestment on an epic scale. For the past decade, we, the Western world, have spent $4 trillion in wind and solar. And we've moved our use of, car of carbon-based energy from 83% total to 81% total. So it's $4 trillion that has really not even moved the needle. Um, and I think the bill for that is coming due. And as it comes due, it will be hopefully a, a realization by voters that we've been led down the primrose path by, by policymakers. Well, it's right. never a bright morning when you're talking about both Toynbee and Marx uh, as the <laughs> for the political cultural uh, economy. <laughs> Uh, that you're discussing. Hey, listen, here's a question that comes to us from Timothy Longo. Uh, and this sort of gets to the point that you were making, Louis, in terms of uh, where is marginal production going to come from, from an energy perspective. Timothy wants to know, Cuppy, what's your preferred way to maximize return on the uranium play? What publicly traded in the U.S. one could look at to take advantage? Cheers, he says. Well, I think the, the thing that's most twerked, honestly, is fraught physical uranium trust or a yellow cake, which also owns physical uranium. Everyone has this idea that you're going to get torqued by buying the miners. But, you know, look at where GDX was when uh, it first came out and gold was about 600. Gold's been a triple and GDX is down. I mean, where's your torque? It's uh, 15 years of retained earnings and reinvestment and you have you know negative returns to show for it. Uh, I think it's going to be even worse than a lot of the, the mining companies because the two largest ones, Cameco and uh, Kazatomprom, have sold forward a lot of their production for the next few years. So if the price of uranium goes up, they don't really get much advantage of it. And then the other guys are all going to raise billions and billions of capital to build the mines that you know is the reason that they exist. They're one mine assets, most of them, and so they're going to spray the street with shares. And then you know they're not going to get the advantage of when the the price goes up because their mine will have maybe one year of peak production before you know there's a glut of uranium again. It just seems like a terrible way to invest. And I don't want to you know name any names, but they all seem just terrible to me. And I own a few of them, but I just own them because I can't have my whole uh, fund only own uh, sprout physical uranium. But, you know, I, I think, you know, the history of uh, commodities is that they tend to overshoot dramatically uh, and they don't usually stay at extremes for long periods of time. And I want to own the physical commodity during the period of it overshooting. Uh, the history of producers is that they tend to price in, you know, a baseline level of the price and earnings. And you know, they don't really get much multiple expansion. And so you have a uranium stock that's worth three or four times earnings based on, I don't know, $80 is the marginal cost where 
you know, there's enough uranium for everyone. Well, these things are already overvalued mostly. And so, no, I just think you, you own physical uranium because it can go to an insane number. Uh, I was just at a uranium conference and all the utilities are short, all the, the traders are short, a lot of the producers are short, a lot of the intermediaries, the fabricators, everyone's short and everyone's lent material and they can't get it back. And everyone's about to declare force majeure on each other. And uh, they can't get material from one location to another. And the whole ecosystem of trading this stuff broke down. It reminds me of subprime where in like uh, the fall of 2007, it looked like the whole, the wheels were coming off the thing. And then everyone's just like, don't worry about it. And you know, you remember Michael Burry, you know, banging his head against the wall. Cause why are my, you know, uh, CDS cubes at 101 when everyone's defaulting? I have the data, they're all defaulting. And it's still trading at 101. It's costing me a billion dollars a week to hold this position. And he's just banging his head against the wall. And, you know, that's, that's how uranium feels right now because in a normal, and this is, I think, what's messing with people in a normal physical market, if I like oil, I buy oil futures. If other people agree with me, they buy oil futures. Well, then the price of oil goes up. And it's very, you know, immediate. And if I looked at a world like uranium, where the demand is uh, 210, let's say, uh, uh, next year, and the supply is 160, and there's a 50 million deficit, call it 25% for round numbers. I mean, if the oil market was a 20, 25 million barrels a day deficit, oil would be like a thousand right now. Everyone would be freaking out. But instead, there's no way for you know me to go out there and buy uh, physical uranium. I mean, you have to get licensed, you have to store it. You know, it takes two years to get all the certifications. So there's no like uh, capital markets. There's no traders. There's no hedge funds. There's, there's no one there to do the the price discovery thing that takes the price up so you incentivize mines to turn back on. So you know when that all happens and it's going to happen, it's going to overshoot in a very dramatic way, and then it takes five years for the mines to come on. And I think this could really overshoot because unlike oil, where there's like, you know, you have switching, you can uh, use less oil if the price goes up. There's all these things you could do. You could use other products. You could, you know, take the train, you know. Uh, when it comes to uranium, you build a mine, you you operate the thing and you just need the the uranium. And so, you know, we already know what the demand number is going to be every year into the future for like five years, maybe even 10 years with pretty good certainty. And we know that the supply number isn't there. And, you know, we know the best outcome for supply but mines break, mines have trouble, stuff goes wrong. It can only get worse from here. I mean, the deficits only can get worse from here. You know, it's not like they're going to say, wow, our mine did, you know, 130% of nameplate. That just doesn't happen. So I, I just think it's going to overshoot and it's going to do something insane. Louis, did you want to uh, comment on that? No, I think uh, Kopi said it all, to be honest. I think uh, <laughs> the one thing I would add, the one thing I would add perhaps to this is, I think there's a real shift in the zeitgeist regarding nuclear in that two, three years ago, nuclear was a dirty word. It was nobody wanted to even consider building new nuclear unless you were China and India. That was basically it. And I think Russia's invasion of Ukraine shifted a lot of people's mindset where they realized, hold on, nuclear actually gives me energy independence, you know, with just a few pounds of, of uranium, I can produce electricity for a year. I'm exaggerating, of course, but um, it's all of a sudden uh, dramatically, dramatically shifted the zeitgeist where we've moved from, ooh, let's worry about a potential nuclear accident that may or may not kill one or two people to uh, all of a sudden geostrategic independence. And when you think in geostrategic independence term, there really is nothing better than nuclear. Um, because you can, you can buy and store a lot of uranium and not so much space. Um, so you can be fully energy independent. That's where we were in France, you know, in France, the mantra following the seventies, uh, oil shocks where we don't have oil, but we have ideas. Uh, I, you know, we're smart. We can build nuclear plants and we did. And then we got dumb. Then we decided, oh, screw the nuclear. We're going to build windmills and solar. And that's been a disaster. So we are, I think, all over Europe, people are realizing, hmm, nuclear is not so bad. And so that's a, an important stru structural shift in the zeitgeist. Well, and plus you have uh, from the global north, these punitive policies for carbon, right? That is pushing yep. the marginal demand into a new direction. I mean, it's just- it's yeah, but, but on this, remember that in Europe, um, nuclear, because of German lobbying, nuclear, you know, they want to protect their wind industry. Nuclear is still not seen as a renewable energy. It's nuts, but- it's, uh, you know, if you want to get like, you know, your proper ESG points, you got to be in, in solar or wind. 
And that's all linked to German lobbying efforts. And, and it is frank, to France, to France laying down way too easy. I agree completely with Louis. Like it's the geopolitical uh, energy independence aspect to this. I mean, if we had invented uh, nuclear last week, that's all we'd be talking about. We wouldn't be talking about AI. We'd be talking about how you have this carbon free, clean energy that's the lowest cost energy that is safe, that uh, is super reliable. And you can store literally all the energy that a country the size of France needs in like a shipping container. And you can just set up a couple of these things and you have 10 year supply of energy and you're good to go. You don't have to worry about all this nonsense. You can't let, you know, Putin can't just bully you because you have it all. You have a 10 year stockpile of stuff. You know, it's just this thing that because of 60 years of baggage uh, and a couple accidents, the world got stupid. China's not stupid. They're building these things nonstop. And at a fraction of the cost I, on this, you know, you look, China just opened this year six nuclear plants at a cost of $18 billion. I think the, the U.S. built one in 30 years, the one in Georgia that just opened at a cost of, uh, I think, about $30 billion, if I'm, my numbers are right. So when you think of it, basically China's opening nuclear plants at roughly a, a tenth of the cost of, of the U.S. So if you start off with the premise and, and it takes them a tenth of the time as well. To, to, it takes three years in China, 30 in the U.S. So if you start off with the premise that economic activity is energy transformed, uh, today, you know, China has a huge comparative advantage in that it can wheel out nuclear plants quickly and cheaply uh, to the point where actually they're in the running to build one for Saudi Arabia. Um, to me, that's, you know, th that's the, one of the biggest game changers out there. Remember five years ago, we were all talking about how China was going to steal us, is stealing our jobs. China's running, you know, unfair trade surpluses. Well, back then, five years ago, China's trade surpluses was 30 billion a month. Now they're 80 billion a month. And really, China is actually now stealing our jobs. Five years ago, they were building plastic toys and, and cotton underwear. Um, and and nobody and no, and we were talking about stealing our jobs when you know nobody was producing cotton underwear in the U.S. anymore. Now they're producing cars, they're producing earth-moving equipment, they're producing telecom switches, they're producing nuclear plants, um, and all you hear in the media. And they are stealing our jobs. They got an 80 billion trade surplus, and all you hear in the media is how they're about to implode uh, and China's youth unemployment problem. It's like, to me, it's 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 just mind-boggling. This is one of those conversations that I never want to end, uh, but we've been going long here. Just it's such a fantastic conversation with both of you. Uh, let's go around the horn real quick. 60 seconds, final thoughts, key takeaways. Uh, we've covered a tremendous amount of ground here. Uh, Louis, first to you. I'll finish with a Baudelaire quote that the devil's greatest trick is to make you believe he didn't exist. And I think today China's pulling off a great trick, telling us that they're imploding when they're eating our lunch in industry after industry. Uh, countries that run 80 billion trade surpluses don't implode. Uh, 80 billion a month. Um, you know, it's, you know, they just don't implode. So I think they're, they're pulling off a really good one on us. Copy, final thoughts, key takeaways. Uh, the VIX is 13, and I don't think it's going to stay at 13. Uh, I think you want to degross. I think you want to stay liquid. I think you want to stay in liquid assets. Um, I, I think, you know, I don't know when, but I think sometime soon, like the whole underpinning of everything we've known to be true in this uh, world from a financial standpoint will be undone. And it'll be undone because the 10-year moves just enough that it all cascades and falls apart. Everything's built on the 10-year which used to be bedrock, and now it's quicksand. Yeah, by the way, I was actually just looking at that. I, I read uh, earlier this morning that I think that the VIX is down about 35 36% year-to-date, uh, S&P up uh, over 17%, make of that what you will, or almost 17%, 16 and a half, I think, right now. Sorry. Guys, just, go ahead. No, no, I was just, never mind, never mind. I, I thought it was a question. Sorry. I was going to say, I was, I was going to say, you have, at this point, you've got rising gasoline prices and rising mortgage rates. Um, you've had mortgage rates, gasoline prices up 20% year on year and mortgage rates uh, up more than 200 basis points. It's seldom a year on year. It's seldom a super happy combo. 
Yeah, and just a ter- just a terrific conversation, guys. Uh, some really deep analysis here and specifics on how you play this from a market perspective. Just a fantastic, fantastic conversation. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thanks a bunch. Hey, thanks for having me on. Thanks. Good to catch up, Cuppy. Always. Great to see you. Listen, guys, uh, again, tomorrow... Sir. Tomorrow, uh, we're going to continue this crash or boom series here on Real Vision. Uh, Tuesday, September 19th, live at 11 a.m., I will be hosting Tracy Shukart, also known as Shy Girl, and Rick Rule, talking about all the connections between macro energy and industrial material. Uh, Very much conversation, some of the themes we've talked about here. I'm sure you guys are going to enjoy that one as well. See you tomorrow, everybody. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.